It's May, and the night sky is shifting again. In the north, galaxy season is still going strong, but this is the last month that truly dominate. Globular clusters are rising, and a new season is just around the corner. In the south, the Milky Way takes over, stretching high across the sky. And with a meteor shower in the mix, there's something to explore in every direction. I'm Tim, and you're watching Cosmic Captures. Whether you're after deep sky images or nightscapes, timing matters. And nothing affects that more than the Moon. In May, the phases line up like this. The first quarter lands on May the 4th. The full moon this month is called the Flower Moon and follows on the 12th. And we get the last quarter on May the 20th. And then the new moon on May 27th. To make planning easier, I've updated the Moonlight Astrophotography Planner, also called MAP, on my website with clear recommendations for broadband and narrowband imaging. Are you looking for wide field scenes or nightscapes this month? Here's what the skies have in store. With the winter Milky Way now gone, all eyes turn to the summer Milky Way arch in its bright detailed core. In the north, you will still need to wait for the early hours to catch it rising. But in the southern hemisphere, the Milky Way is already climbing high, stretching across the sky in all its glory. It's a great month to scout out foregrounds, frame up panoramas or even try for a full Milky Way arch. A strong foreground can turn a good nightscape into something unforgettable. And if you're already up before dawn, there's one more thing to look for in the sky. This month's meteor shower, the Eta Aquarius, peak around May 5th to 6th and are best seen in the early morning hours. They are part of the dust tail left behind by Halley's Comet, tiny fragments from its ancient tail burning up in our atmosphere. They are not the most famous meteor shower, but they are fast, bright and more active the further south you are. In the southern hemisphere, you could catch 30 to 50 meteors per hour under dark skies. And in the north, the numbers are lower, but still worth watching, especially if you're already out for the Milky Way. But now, to the deep sky targets of this month, and we'll start with something iconic, not a distant galaxy, but a swarm of ancient stars right here in our own galaxy's halo. M13, also called the Great Hercules Cluster, is the most prominent global cluster in the northern sky and one of the brightest and most impressive targets of the season. It's located in the constellation Hercules, about 22,000 light years away, and holds over 300,000 stars packed into a dense sphere roughly 145 light years across. Globular clusters are some of the oldest structures in the universe tightly bond balls of ancient stars orbiting our galaxy. They are also surprisingly forgiving to photograph. Because the stars are bright pinpoint light sources, you can even image them during brighter nights, including those near the full moon. All stars are broadband light emitters, so you will want to use RGB or LRGB imaging techniques. No narrowband filters. To avoid burning out the bright core, aim for shorter exposures around 120 seconds per frame. The goal is to preserve the star colors and maintain structure all the way into the dense center. M13 is a beautiful and bright globular cluster and May is the perfect time to capture it at its best. But now, let's move out into deep space to a spiral galaxy with a much looser structure. M63 
also known as the Sunflower Galaxy, is located in the constellation Canis Vinatiki and about 27 million light years away. It spans around 100,000 light years, roughly the size of our own galaxy. M63 is a flocculent spiral, meaning its arms don't form clear grand patterns like M51 and M101. Instead, it has a patchy textured appearance with clumps of star-forming regions and scattered dust lanes. M63 is part of the M51 group, a collection of galaxies named after its brightest member, the Whirlpool Galaxy M51, which I presented in last month's video. Photographically, it's a great target for medium to long focal lengths and tends to reveal more the longer you shoot. You will want to use broadband filters, either RGB or LRGB, to bring out the subtle colors in the disk, the soft yellow core and the faint pinks in the H-alpha regions. M63 also has a very low surface brightness halo, an extended feature that's only visible with deep integrations under dark skies. So if you're up for a challenge, try pushing your exposures to see how much of the fainter outer structure you can reveal. And next, we turn to two ancient star swarms side by side, offering a striking contrast in structure and brightness. M53 is a bright compact globular cluster located in constellation Coma Berenikis, around 58,000 light years away. It's easily visible in a small telescope and offers a dense, rich appearance, a textbook example of a well formed cluster. Just a short distance away in the sky appears NGC 5053, which tells a different story. NGC 5053 is also a globular cluster, but it is much more diffuse and less concentrated. In fact, it is one of the least dense globular clusters known, and it looks almost ghostly next to M53. These two clusters aren't just visually close, they may actually be physically interacting, connected by faint stellar streams revealed in deep surveys. For astrophotographers, the pair fits beautifully in a field of view of around 1.5 to 2.5 degrees, ideal for mid-range setups or even smart telescopes with a wider field of view. Use RGB or LRGB filters and be sure to keep exposures short enough to preserve the structure and star color in both clusters, especially in the bright core of M53. This is a unique opportunity to frame two very different globular clusters in a single shot. And now, to the highlight of this month. A region of the sky that feels like it was made for astrophotography, and perhaps the most spectacular of them all. The Roe of Fiuchi region isn't just the highlight of this month. It is one of the most rewarding targets out there. And May is the perfect time to go after it. It's located in the constellation Scorpius, not far from the bright core of the Milky Way. And it's surprisingly easy to find and photograph. It firmly sits in my top five deep sky objects of all time. And it has everything astrophotographers dream of. It's the kind of target that pulls you in and keeps surprising you the deeper you go. You will find Golden Antares, one of the most vibrant stars in the night sky, glowing beside bluish reflection nebulae, dark dust lanes, emission nebulae and the globular cluster M4, all woven together in a single field. A field of view of around 5 degrees is ideal to frame the full structure. And I will show you a few examples. This is a 50 mm wide field image that puts the region in context with the Milky Way's core. And this image I took with a 135 mm lens on a full frame camera, which frames the entire structure beautifully. And at 412 mm I had to stitch together a four panel mosaic just to fit most of it. It's that extensive. This is an excellent target for DSLR and mirrorless shooters. 
even with just 15 minutes of integration time, you can start to capture its color and structure. Though, as always, more data makes a big difference. When it comes to filtration, stick with broadband imaging techniques. That means LRGB, RGB or one-shot color cameras. This is a target where preserving the star colors and soft gradients really pays off. And the dark sky will take your result to the next level. This region is easier to capture from the southern hemisphere, where it climbs high into the night sky. From where I live in Sweden, it stays too low on the horizon to image successfully. But if you're located in lower northern latitudes, give this one a try or plan to capture it when you're on vacation further south. If you have limited time and gear and can only shoot one target this month, make it this one, especially if you've never imaged it before. Have you photographed Ruo or Fiuchi before? Or is it still on your list? I would love to hear how you approached it or what you're planning this time around. And now, we head back into deep space to a galaxy that shares surprising similarities with our own. M83, also known as the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy, is a phase-on barred spiral located in the constellation Hydra about 15 million light years away. It's roughly the same size as the Milky Way, around 100,000 light years across, and belongs to a small galaxy group just like ours. It has a central bar, well-defined spiral arms and widespread star-forming regions. All features we believe exist in our own galaxy, though we can't observe the Milky Way from the outside. In a way, M83 gives us the glimpse of what the Milky Way might look like from far away. Photographically, it is one of the best southern galaxies to shoot. A field of view of around 1 degree works well for framing, whether you're using a small refractor or a larger telescope. But you can also tackle it with a smart telescope. Stick to RGB and LRGB imaging to bring out its natural color. You will see a soft yellow core, pinkish H-alpha regions in the arms and delicate dust lanes, all visible with broadband data under dark skies. This is a classical spiral galaxy and a perfect mix of structure, color and astrophysical context. For our next target, we shift to a bold dramatic nebula one shaped by intense radiation and the birth of new stars. NGC 6188, also known as the Fighting Dragons of Ara, is a striking emission nebula in the constellation Ara, located about 4,000 light years away. And honestly, the Fighting Dragons of Ara has to be one of the most epic names in the night sky. It sounds like something pulled straight out of a legendary fantasy saga. In the ancient skies of Era, two mighty dragons weave their endless dance across the stars, and the lone wanderer stands ready not to conquer, but to capture the wonders of the heavens. Yeah, anyways, its structured appearance comes from powerful stellar winds and radiation, carving out the gas and dust into shapes that resemble two battling dragons. The nearby open cluster NGC 6193 lights up the region from within, making it an active and ongoing site for star formation. Photographically, NGC 6188 fits well into a field of view of around 1 to 1.5 degrees, and it's visible only from the southern hemisphere. This is a classic narrowband target. With a mono camera, you will want to use H-alpha, O3 and sulfur 2 filters and ideally combine it with RGB star data for natural star colors. For one-shot color cameras, a dual narrowband filter with H-alpha and O3 works very well. Smart telescopes like the Seastar S50 can capture it, but it is a serious project that requires many hours of integration. Definitely one for the more dedicated users. Emission nebulae like this 
are also a creative playground and it is worth experimenting with different color palettes to bring out the full beauty and structure. And which one works best? That is entirely up to you. We've covered nebulae, star clusters and galaxies. But now we're heading to a part of the sky that stands out for a different reason. Not for its brightness, but for its shape, simplicity and quiet presence. This is the first time I feature an entire constellation in a Cosmic Highlights video. But Crux more than earns that spotlight. It's the smallest constellation in the sky, yet it forms a perfectly shaped cross that's so iconic that it appears in national flags of Australia, New Zealand, Brazil and others across the Southern Hemisphere. Right beside it is the Colsec Nebula, one of the most prominent dark nebulae in the night sky. It doesn't emit light, it blocks it. The cold sack is a dense cloud of interstellar dust easily visible to the naked eye as a dark patch poking a hole into the Milky Way. Photographically, this region is perfect for DSLR and mirrorless shooters. If you want to focus just on the crux and the cold sack, something around 135mm on a full frame camera works beautifully. But if you want to show more of the surrounding Milky Way context, try stepping back to 85 or even 50 millimeters. Use broadband imaging techniques, and that means no additional filters. And focus on capturing the subtle contrast in the dark regions while preserving the beautiful natural star colors throughout the frame. This region is beautiful in its own quiet way. And in many ways it feels like it's the opposite of the Rho of Yuji region. Not vibrant and colorful, but calm, dark and carved out of starlight. If you'd like all the target info in one place, including filters, field of view suggestions and imaging tips, you can download the CAP file for free from my website. It's updated each month to help you plan your astrophotography session. And now, I would like to hear which of these targets are you most excited about? Or is there one you've already captured that others should try? Let me know in the comments. I always enjoy hearing what you're working on. And if you're looking for more inspiration, many of last month's targets are still well placed in the sky. So be sure to check them out. That's it for this month. Now, go see what's out there and capture the dragons.